古来日本は休日堅実壮術柔術と優れたる武術の国として全世界に知られておりますことに柔術にその源を発した柔道はスポーツとしてますます盛んになり今や世界各国とも競って柔道を学びつつありますさて日本における空手の歴史は浅く大正の末期時の文部大臣が主催する体育展覧会が開催されるに及び特に文部省の招きに応じ当時沖縄県勝部会会長をたりし船越義鎮王が上京された時に始まります由来育成層空手道のために永遠として努力を続けてきた多くの人々が今日の空手道を一躍全世界の注目を浴びるに至るまでに完成したのであります全ての武道が健全なる肉体を縁がために邁進するごとく我が空手もまたその優れたる技を磨きその完成されてゆく技の上に立って高潔なる人格を求め気づかんとするものであります神前にはい先生にはいで空手は人体の利用できうるすべての部分を最大限に活用し自己を守ることを基礎として練習を行います特に手と足は常に休むことなく鍛錬し都市空間よくその一月一蹴りで富士の敵を制することができるのであります月、蹴り、受けこれが一貫して行われる空手道の定義であり基礎技術でありますまず月の技から見ることにいたしましょう月は空手道入門の始めから終わりまで終始行われる最も重要な技であり厳しい鍛錬が要求されます月には直突き上げ突き回し突き鍵突き裏突き山突きもろ手突きなど実に一つの拳がこのように多彩な技として利用されます空手の月はひねりながら突き出し当たる瞬間全身の力を拳に集中して突く力学的にして合理的なものであります蹴りは月とともに空手道における二大武器であります蹴りには前蹴り横蹴り蹴込み回し蹴り飛び蹴りなどがあり月と同様変化の多い技でありますその練習も極めて困難なものであり普段の努力が要求されます拳や足の鍛錬には巻き藁という木の頭に藁を巻いたものやサンドバッグパンチボールなどの道具によって手や足を鍛え想像以上の威力を発揮できるようになります空手に先手なしというごとく空手はまず受けから始まります受けは攻撃してくるものの体力その方法また事故の体勢などによっていろいろな変化をします敵の攻撃力が強ければ強いほど受け方以下によって敵は自分の力で自滅する場合もあります
Masters of the Martial Arts Historical Video Series Collector's Edition, Part 2, Volume 1, Gishin Funakoshi. Universally known as the founder of modern-day karate, Gishin Funakoshi, father of the Shotokan system, was born in Okinawa in 1868. Funakoshi's first martial arts instructor was Yasutsuno Azato, with whom he trained while in primary school. In 1902, Funakoshi's karate demonstration for the commissioner of schools, Shintaro Ozawa, led to the introduction of karate into the physical education programs of several schools. He was responsible for the propagation of karate throughout Okinawa and the world. And in 1913, he formed a team of martial artists to travel across Okinawa to demonstrate the art. The team was compiled of many renowned karateka, including Choki Motobu, Kenwa Mabuni, and Chotuko Kayan. The first national sports exhibition in 1922 in Tokyo to publicly display karate jutsu. While in Japan, Funakoshi was introduced to Jigaro Kano, the founder of judo, who asked him to demonstrate karate at the Kodokan. Funakoshi's friendship with Kano grew and they exchanged many ideas between the two arts. Kano adopted many techniques from karate jutsu for use in the judo system, and Funakoshi utilized Kano's ranking system for recognizing a student's qualifications and abilities. In 1933, Funakoshi changed the concept of kata from its original meaning of China, written in Chinese characters, to empty, and had it redrawn with Japanese characters. Next, he replaced the jutsu with do or wei. Hence the term karate do, or empty hand wei, was born. This name change was due in large part to Funakoshi's philosophical convictions associated with martial arts. In Tokyo in 1936, at the age of 68, Funakoshi established the Shotokan, the world's first freestanding karate dojo. Shotokan means Hall of Shoto, and Shoto was actually the name Funakoshi used when signing his poetry. In 1955, Funakoshi was head of the first dojo of the Japan Karate Association until his death in Tokyo two years later. Funakoshi and his teachings influenced many prestigious martial artists, both directly and indirectly, including the aforementioned Jigaro Kano, Wado Ryu founder, Hironori Otsuka Kyoku Shinkai founder, Matsutatsu Oyama and Shito Ryu founder, Kenwa Mabuni.
this is on Gishin Funakoshi, and uh, this is the karate tape on Gishin Funakoshi, as well as the 1956 uh, uh, video of the JKA. David, what can you tell us about this tape on Gishin Funakoshi and the rarity of this tape? It's very rare. Um, practicing, I practiced uh, karate for 25 years, and in the last probably four or five years, doing in-depth study um, into Fungoshi and the roots of Shotokan karate. And uh, as far as I know, I, I talked to many historians um, from England, uh, from Japan, uh, and here in America. Nobody had this film, so this film is is very very rare. I'm not exactly sure of the time frame, but we're looking at a date from approximately about 1949 to about 1955 in that time frame. Maybe we can pinpoint that. However, what you are seeing is a man who is in his 80s performing Devant Mute or one point sparring. There's from two angles, and you can see very, very clear that Funagoshi is very, very exact. Okay. Now one of the things that you'll notice is that Funagoshi stances, um, they're much more natural, approximately shoulder length apart. In karate, he changed the bed after his death and got longer, but you're going to see Funagoshi, um, how he taught his karate. One interesting thing about this, this tape is uh, when you see Funagoshi he had a very, very strong grip. You notice with him, since they were part of his punching in. Funagoshi parries the blow, but he's either got a hold of the wrist or the knee. He's like, just pulls him a little off balance. Funagoshi was very short in stature, even for Okinawan standards. He was, at best, 5 feet tall, 135 pounds at best. Sero Baka was quite bigger, and many of Funagoshi's students were bigger than him after all he taught some American GIs. But you can notice that he could get inside of them. He would parry the blow, he would have this person off, off balance, and fire up a very fast punch. What makes this tape extraordinary is that, again, when you start to look at people of his age in this era that can, you know, walk or um, move around as agile as Funagoshi. This is what, you know, all those years of karate training has done for him. And all those years date back to when he was a youth in Okinawa. Since they, Funagoshi was born premature, his date is a little obscure. Um, for the record, uh, they say he was born 18 November of 1868. He altered his birthday to say 1970 so he could take some examinations to get into a medical college in Tokyo and um, so he had to do that so a lot of people say it was 1970 uh, I'm sorry 1870 but it actually was 1868 he died April 6 26 in 1957 so that brings him up close to 90 years old 89 years old when you go back to Okinawa when Funagoshi was, was raised. Um, his father was of um, Shizuzuka, I'm not sure if this pronunciation, of, of, of samurai class. He was of samurai class, so there was a little bit of status quo on Funagoshi's family. There was also a name change. I believe that Funagoshi's real name was uh, Tomonagoshi but which later on changed to Funagoshi. In any case, Funagoshi at a young age was taught uh, the Chinese classics. And that's important because most Okinawans didn't have the opportunity to, you know, to be educated. Um, work was very, very important. So Funagoshi was able to get an education at an early age, mostly through his grandfather. And what was his relationship with the other masters of the other disciplines in uh, Japan? Okay, moving on. From, from, yeah, Funagoshi's 
major instructors or two that talk about is Asato and I type and I toso. Okay. I toso had other students, people like Miyagi Chojin, the founder of Goji, a legend in his own time. And if I could take just a minute to talk about Miyagi Chojin, Miyagi Chojin was recognized as probably the most powerful individual in his his physical strength was probably the highest of, of like people like uh, Ken Wamakuni and, and, and Gichin Fungoshi. He was a very, very powerful man, uh, a wealthy man. And Ken Wamakuni, also a student of Aitoso. Now, don't forget that these guys had trained with other people. Matsumara, Higaona, a lot of different influence. And, but the relationship that the three of them had was very, very cordial and very um, like dojo brothers. I think that they, at that time, when the three of them didn't have a particular style. They just were studying uh, Tote or um, uh, Rokyu, Kempo, whatever you, they were calling it back then. It wasn't really called karate then, yes and no. But the three of them shared a common interest, and that was to uh, train in karate and to um, hopefully to introduce karate to the world because they believed that they were trained warriors. Now, what that meant was that the three of them believed that it was like if you gave somebody a gun, that gives you a lot of power. Okay, you can do two things. You can have a gun for peaceful purposes, and you can have a gun to take the life. The way they trained was almost the same thing. They had the power to take a life, and they had the power to use it for defense only. The three of them had that consensus amongst them. And so with that, they kind of um, had the same philosophies. So I believe that, and, and many, many references um, we talk to Goju people about Funagoshi. Uh, those who were around at those times have, have much respect for one another. I think that, um, like modern day times, Goju people stick with Goju, Shotokan sticks with Shotokan, Shitoru sticks with, uh, uh, you know, the police of Kenwamo Boon. But back in their days, when you ask about uh, the three of them, they had uh, tremendous harmony amongst each other. And they worked out with each other whenever they could and helped out um, with each other whenever they could. What can you actually tell us about the, the naming of the style of Shotokan? Hmm. Interesting. Okay, Funagoshi, besides being a, a great karate man, uh, Funagoshi wrote a lot of poems, mostly about karate. And so when he signed these poems, he would sign it under his nickname, Shoto. Shoto translated means pine waves. And he got that name because many times when he left Azato's house or Aitoso's house, he would have to walk through these paths that would take him to these pine trees. And this was when Fungoshi would think about you know, writing poems or think about nature in itself. And the pine waves, he thought, was a fitting name to nickname himself for, the, for these poems. So in 1935, or 36, when they, uh, his students erected the first dojo, they called it the Hall of Shoto, and thus the name Shotokan. Kan meaning building, Shoto meaning pine waves. The Hall of Shoto was, was developed in 1936. Unfortunately, it was destroyed during the, the war of 1945. But that's how uh, Shotokan, and, and it wasn't Funagoshi, even in his autobiography, he's honest, but he's not. He, he still believes at that time that karate should be won. Karate do, the way of the empty hand. Uh, however, you know, Shotokan became a style, um, you know, and, and it almost became Japanese, obviously, its influence was in Okinawa. Who else do we see on this video? Oh, with the video of, of, of uh, Brother Two, as you see, as you can 
you see, there are, there, there are many legends uh, on the tape. You can see, um, I say, Obata, one of Fugoshi's uh, senior students, who was uh, at one time a member of the JKA, but then left. Um, you're going to see uh, Sensei Nakayama, who probably uh, helped JKA or made JKA what it is today. There are people like Okazaki, who was here in the United States in Philadelphia. Nishiyama, who was out in California. Uh, Yanoida, who was out in England. Kanazawa, also out in England. Um, uh, a lot of these people, Nagami, he's uh, out in Louisiana. So there's many, uh, many people that are in that film that are still alive today. Great. David, can you tell us how uh, Master Funakoshi popularized karate in Japan? Okay. Uh, upon the uh, request of the Ministry of Education and the Emperor himself, Funakoshi had already did a demonstration in Japan in like 1917, returned to Okinawa, but then was asked to go back. So in 1922, Funakoshi set off in Japan to popularize karate. If you look at that time era, what was happening in Japan was judo had a good foothold, kendo was very, very popular, and karate was something very obscure. What Funagoshi did when, when he went over to, to Japan was he did a few demonstrations, was widely received, but nothing happened. Funagoshi had to take residence up at the uh, Mitsujuka, a dormitory, which was a dormitory for Okinawan immigrants. And Funagoshi had a hard time trying to popularize karate. In fact, he lived so poorly that, you know, he had to you know, tell the cooks that, you know, like, you know, if you could give me something to eat, I would teach you karate. At best, at that time, he had maybe 10 students. So he had to work to clean up the place and, and take care of the mail just to survive in Japan. This is all taking place in 20. So he had a lot of dead time, but karate was always on his mind. So in 1922, he wrote a book, Rokyu Kempo. In this book, it's basically line drawings and Funagoshi's philosophy about karate, what it should be, and how, what kind of an attitude that you should have for it. And the book did very, very well. What happened was there was a big demand for it. Unfortunately, in 1923, a major earthquake happened in Japan. What it did was, it destroyed the publishing house, and um, the book became like, you know, it went off in obscurity. So now there was a, another demand to at least write another book. So, 1925, 1926, in that era, Funagoshi wrote a second book called Tote uh, Jitsu, or Rattan Karate Jitsu. And um, in that book, he uses a lot of photographs. And so a little bit revised edition of the, the first one. That started to become very uh, popular. But in that time frame, another major thing happened. The earthquake also did damage to the uh, dormitory when Goshi was staying at. There was a famous kendo master that was living at the time. That had, his name was uh, Kurumichi or Harado Nakayama. He heard that Funagoshi's dojo or dormitory was damaged. So he allowed Funagoshi to come and teach at his dojo. And this is a major, major thing that happened in Japan because what, what, you know, it happens all the time now, but, you know, martial arts. Back then, we're like, this is kendo, and you just do kendo, this is judo, you just do judo, and, and karate. And uh, this uh, famous Nakayama invited Funagoshi to teach on the walk times. And because of Nakayama's influence, if Nakayama is allowing this Okinawan to teach karate, then this gentleman must have something of value. And Funagoshi's uh, students started to increase. And from that point, Funagoshi did another smart thing. He went and introduced karate to 
to the university. A lot of them claim, you know, we, he taught here first, he taught there first. Um, that's up to, you know, how you look at it. But he got into the universities such as Keio, uh, Jose, Tokyo, and a number of them. And that's when karate started to um, really start to get popular. And Fungoshi would travel around to these universities at least once a week to see how practice uh, came from. You're talking now in the, in the 30s um, when the Shotokan, getting back to when the Shotokan was developed, Funagoshi had three sons and a daughter. Funagoshi had a third son named Yoshitaka, they're called Kiko, and he was a very talented individual, a little bit bigger than his father and a little bit heavier, um, but a lot younger. The at that time, you have to remember that, you know, Japan had kendo as a sport and judo as a sport. Back in Okinawa, karate wasn't done as a sport. Karate was done as self-defense. So the mindset in Japan is competitive, especially amongst universities. And so what was happening was that Yoshitaka being of that college age or um, he could see that karate was very dry the way Funagoshi was teaching him. A lot of kaka, a lot of makiwara. So the son was coming up with innovations to introduce instead of sanban kumute, nippon kumute, three point spawn, one point spawn, to make jinyu kumute or three spawn. I mean, a little bit more interesting. The father allowed it to happen, but he didn't, he never taught it. The style was very structured. For example, Funagoshi in all his books or all his films um, that are available, you're never going to see Funagoshi doing a roundhouse kick. Um, his his karate was very very simple, front kick, side kick. That was basically it. But the son started to introduce the roundhouse kick, the back kick, and I guess Mr. Funagoshi allowed it to happen because he could see the interest of the students. Uh, what is the basic difference and does this film show the difference between Shotokan Karate in its uh, pioneer days and Shotokan Karate of today? Well, there's very small footage of, of Funagoshi, but what it does show is the basics and it shows um, the stance level. I think that Funagoshi believed that you could stand approximately shoulder level apart and be very very strong if your focus was there and if you look at modern JKA stances they're a lot longer one of the pluses of that is that your center of balance is lower to the ground you are strong it, it's harder to do it your, your legs are longer so um, you're deeper in your strength your, your stance so yes there's a uh, there's some truth to the stability of the stance. The problem with the stance is that, is that it takes, it's like physics. To get from point A to point B, you have to travel longer. And so therefore, it cuts down on speed. They do practice speed drills, but I think Funagoshi's uh, principle was stand naturally, make it focused, and you could still be as strong and fast you have to get as deep. That's one of the, of the differences. In summary, uh, on this videotape, is there anything that you would say um, is of uh, historical significance other than the foot footage on Funakoshi? On this videotape, can you sum up for the people who are watching, what are the things that they should be really watching for? Okay, I, I think for people who are watching this tape that you can see that um, a lot of basics are done. A lot of basics um, that people that are alive today and who are of high caliber um, spent a lot of time doing um, rising blocks or snap kicks over and over and over and over again. And um, I think if modern day people can get bored with repetition and want to move on to other things, I don't know if that's good or bad, but you can see
see that these people spent a lot of time just training in the basics.